Hello everybody, on this Monday, October 11th, 2010, I'm Spencer Mazik and this is the Bloomberg Law Podcast, a series of interviews focusing on trends in the busy legal profession. Today we want to discuss how to protect your brand in the realm of social media. Joining us in studio for today's discussion is Robert Zelnick. He's a partner at McDermott, Will & Emery, and has spent nearly 10 years as head of the firm's global trademark practice group. Welcome, Robert, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Spencer. Okay, so let's begin by discussing the reasons why brand owners might consider using social media sites like Facebook and Twitter. What are some of the benefits? Mm -hmm. Well, Spencer, the, the growth and popularity of the social media sites really points to certain advantages that consumers and branding companies must be recognizing. Facebook, for example, has now over 500 million users mm -hmm. and Twitter, uh, MySpace and others aren't far behind. We have newer sites like Dig uh, and Tumblr and I think new ones coming along all the time. So they're on to something and I think that this is something that's here to stay. Why are they so popular with businesses? Well. The social media websites offer an extraordinary opportunity for businesses to, to have their brands interact with consumers on a real basis. Traditional advertising in print, magazines, newspapers, outdoor advertising such as billboards, that was all considered essentially push advertising where brand companies would push their brands out into the public so that consumers would notice. However, with the advent of social media, we now have a pull from advertising that we haven't seen before. So consumers are logging into social media websites. They're liking particular brands. They're friending certain brands mm -hmm. or certain activities. So there's this tremendous level of interaction and experience, ex live experiences with the brand. All of that, I think, contributes to the popularity. As far as the advantages, there are many. Um, in addition to sort of letting a brand owner pull back the velvet curtain and let people see what the brand really is all about on a day-to-day -day basis, this is relatively low cost and high return advertising. Uh, it increases online traffic and publicity. It brings more eyeballs, not just to the brand, but to the, to the website that ultimately sells goods and services under the brand. Two other ways that there's an advantage that we don't always immediately think about is that it allows the brand to gather intelligence and information from its audience in a, in a very candid way. By virtue of feedback, I suppose, or? Certainly by, feed, certainly by direct feedback, but also by interactive communications among members of the community. I think a lot of advertisers and brand companies have for years sent out surveys and have tried to assess what consumers think about the brands. And they've had some success with that. Some people don't respond. Some people only want to respond to a multiple choice mm -hmm. type question. But, but to have a narrative and to have consumers interacting with others and, and letting the brand owners see that, I think it makes for a much more genuine experience. There's also, of course, the angle of search engine optimization, which is important these days, helping websites get uh, a higher ranking in search results. And certainly, the more ro robust the, the social media participation, the more likely it is that a brand will get a higher search result. Okay, and so companies like Virgin America, Whole Foods, and Red Bull, they all have active Facebook and Twitter accounts, and like you said, they use it to market their brand, and they also use it to interact with millions of users. So tell me, have consumers come to expect popular brands to communicate through social media? I believe they have, by and large. It, it will depend on the particular industry that's involved, but certainly for consumer, consumer goods, uh, food and beverage and other popular brands, people really do expect to find a social media site. Perhaps not as much uh, for industrial goods and things that aren't as consumer facing, but I, I think even with an industrial company, uh, we've seen examples in recent press where there's been criticism of companies like that who haven't immediately posted information on a Twitter or on a Facebook page about what's happening, what's happening next, how is a big problem going to be resolved. So increasingly consumers of all areas are looking to and expecting a social media presence. Okay, and well, and you listed the advantages then, but can there be some disadvantages for just putting your mark out there and using it in social media? Well, I'm not sure I would call it a disadvantages, mm -hmm. but you're right that there are risks uh, in not doing social media correctly. Uh, I think the number one the, the number one point here for me is that this really requires a holistic approach so that you're involving on a team of social media players, you're involving marketing of course, communications of course, but also legal and in many instances crisis communications teams who will all have some involvement in the planning of the social media branding and certainly in responding to things as they come up. 
um, why lawyers, you know, why, that, why am I here talking right, about right. social branding? Mm -hmm. um, certainly we, we handle a lot of things involving e-commerce already for websites, data collection, privacy policies, security, uh, contests and promotions, fulfillment issues, but these are all slightly tweaked in the social media context. We have a more interactive experience and a more real-time experience with a give and take. So we, we help shape the issues in those regards. Also, depending on how regulated the industry is, we may have, for example, with alcohol or tobacco or pharma, there will be industry requirements that have to be abided, and we help point those out and help navigate through But those. is there a concern, though, from brand owners about brand corruption and taking the brand into an undesired um, direction? Certainly, that's one of the potential risks of online uh, social media branding. Um, but I think that you have to deal with that one way or another. Right? There are people who, as, as we say, there are people who are going to be talking about your brand. And if you have some role as the brand owner in helping to shape the communications, setting the tone for those communications, and responding to criticisms when they arise, it's better that that be done through a, a fan site or a website where you have some ongoing monitoring and interaction with them. Okay, so I want to discuss, though, maybe some examples where trademark issues might come into play in social media. And the one thing that comes to mind is vanity URLs. What are they and what are the potential trademark issues here? Mm -hmm. Well, a vanity URL can refer to a couple of different things. Uh, on some websites, there will be a microsite, uh, for example, a hotelcompany.com. I'll have a forward slash and then free weekend nights promotion. And that could be a vanity URL as far as that business goes. Certainly so the URL points to something to which, I mean, I guess the it points to something to which the URL is related then. Yes, okay. that's right. Or in the individual or celebrity context, um, certainly you can have Twitter accounts and you do have Twitter accounts, twitter.com forward slash Robert Zelnick, Spencer Mazik, mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, those are also vanity URLs. And so who can create these vanity URLs? Essentially anybody can. and. Uh, it's, it's interesting that you say who can create them and not who, who owns them. Um, <laughs> sometimes people confuse that and think that, um, for example, a, a Twitter.com with your, your real name after it necessarily belongs to you. But it really, um, the, the social media sites don't view it that way and they view you as an authorized user. The policies vary among different social media. Yeah. And what I wanted to get back to just the vanity URLs, I remember when uh, Facebook announced last year that they were going to allow users to customize usernames and create vanity URLs. Uh, within the first 15 minutes of that announcement, over 500,000 folks had claimed personal URLs for Facebook. So these are hugely popular, I guess, with folks, correct? They are. And I think there may have been some tweaks in policy ever since that was announced by mm -hmm. Facebook. And I think that still they're, they're feeling their way a bit. Um, for example, I think there were some talks about whether or not there would be a charge for a vanity URL. Mm. Um, at the end of the day, it doesn't appear so yet, um, but... Uh, it might be coming. It might be coming, and uh, consumers so far have, as you say, some have done a land grab to try to get as many as they could right out of the gate. Um, but I think things have settled down a bit now. Okay, and I want to move on and talk about impersonation because you hinted at that earlier. Mm -hmm. So might this also be another area for concern in the realm of social media? Certainly it is. And impersonation issues, like many of what we're talking about today, have predated social media's rise to fame, so to speak. Um, one of the more famous cases that involved an impersonation issue was Tony La Russa, the Yeah, Anthony La Russa versus Twitter. Tell yes. us about that case. Yes. Well, someone registered the, the uh, vanity URL, twitter.com slash Tony La Russa, and was actually impersonating Mr. La Russa. Um, that, that's a situation where you, know, you have a problem. I think as a celebrity, you don't want people putting out a message that's attributed to you when it's really not you. We have other kinds of examples, though, in the, in the well, impersonation area. No, absolutely. And I know with that particular case, though, the problem, too, was that the public was duped into believing that the statements were made by Mr. La Russa, which, like you said, another example that comes to mind for me is uh, hacking into accounts. Yes. Um, is, that, is that an area where folks might be concerned? Well, I think they're, I think they're both areas of concern. I think they're, they're different kinds of things. I mean, certainly the person who um, acquired the user rights to Tony LaRusso as a, as a at vanity URL, they didn't do anything illegal to, to acquire that username mm -hmm. or to begin to use it. Uh, it's just that the way they used it, they didn't have any legitimate connection to the name, I understand. 
um, and they were actually misleading the audience. Hacking, I think, is a more um, affirmative act or set of acts where you really break into a computer system and, and accomplish many of the same goals, but in a slightly different way. Okay, yeah, I know that there's a case in the UK now uh, involving uh, Vodafone where its Twitter account was hijacked internally really by an employee there who mm -hmm. made some rather offensive statements there. So it certainly is an issue for most folks to consider. But would you recommend that uh, brand owners use the, I guess, social media sites terms of service in uh, trying to find protection for their brand? Might they be afforded some protection under it? Mm -hmm. Certainly the, the terms of service and the terms and conditions of the social media website are very important and, and I think consumers will find that they vary among social media companies um, and certainly consumers should be aware of what those terms and conditions are before they use the site and if they run into a problem. The terms and conditions will vary from, from social media site to social media site, but typically they provide for some opportunity for a brand owner to complain about a use of their trademark by another, and then there's some mechanism for resolving that um, at, the, at the level of the social media company. For example, I know that Twitter has part of its policy, the trademark policy, is aimed at username squatters. What exactly are they hoping to accomplish with it? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's this, as, as we talked about a moment ago, the, this land grab that happened when user vanity URLs became available, and people grab things whether they had any real legitimate right to them or not, and for those parties who did that, and now use those vanity URLs either to impersonate and mislead the public, or uh, maybe they're not using them at all. Maybe they're just holding 50 or so different celebrity names and in the they, hope of selling them. Okay, they would hold it just to, to sell, perhaps later at a later yes. date. Or some will launch uh, a commentary site where they, you know, it'll be about whatever that vanity name is, and in that case, that's a more difficult issue to resolve as a legal matter. And I know that Twitter also has something called verified accounts. What are they? Mm -hmm. Well, it's essentially uh, what it sounds like. Mm -hmm. it, it gives people an opportunity, particularly well-known people, celebrities, an opportunity to uh, get a stamp of approval, if you will, from Twitter to say, this is an account that it really is me. And so when the public goes to that, they can understand, okay, this has been verified through whatever procedures Twitter employs. And it typically it involves submitting certain personal information, uh, name, address, phone number, that sort of thing. And then I believe Twitter or other media companies will contact some of the members of that online community and, and will help verify that this is actually the person it sounds like it is. Is it available for everybody or is it just for a select few? I think it's available to everyone. I don't believe Twitter will do it for everyone. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, also, I want to ask about impersonation. I know that we talked about it, but I want to clear it up on Twitter because doesn't it allow for parodies? Um, what's the standard for determining whether or not an account is a parody versus an impersonation? Mm -hmm. Well, parody under the law has, has, has been a well-developed uh, body of law for a long time, and essentially a parody is something that makes fun of or mocks or comments upon a brand or, or something else, an original work. And the essence of it is that you, you're not able to effectively accomplish that. You can't really make fun of something unless you name that thing you're trying to make fun of. For it to be protected as parody, normally the brand has to be a central part of what's being mocked or, or commented upon. It can't just be there to attract attention or to attract eyeballs. Mm -hmm. But if there's a genuine parody, then that's not infringement because under the law, the law says that people, reasonable people won't believe that the brand owner is actually behind this since it's making fun. Of, of the underlying brand. Right, <laughs> okay. Well, and, and I don't want to leave Facebook out because doesn't it have a policy where it reserves the right to remove or reclaim a username upon the complaint of a trademark owner? Yes, that's right. I think that most of the social media companies um, have a policy, some variation of that policy in this regard. The common thread seems to be that they reserve the discretion to do what they think is fairest or right um, and, and that's going to be their decision as the owner of that site. And there's so many policies out there, but it's not really clear to me as to what's actually covered under it. Uh, for example, is it, do we know whether or not common law and unregistered marks would be covered under any one of these policies? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we do in some cases. Okay. <laughs> uh, some of the social media companies explicitly say they will only apply their policy to registered marks. So I think th the best advice there is that if you have a brand you're serious about or if you have a name that you do merchandising under, definitely register it as a trademark. It's, it's a great way to prevent this problem in the first place. But 
if you can't get a federal trademark registration, or maybe you are a government agency, or maybe you're a nonprofit, for example, that, that just doesn't have that in its budget, I think the sites will work with you to some extent if you have extenuating circumstances like that. But certainly getting the federal registration is the best idea. Okay, and some folks have suggested that Facebook and other social media sites adopt a model that's similar to the uniform domain name resolution policy. Do you agree with that? And also, can you just tell us what does the UDRP provide? Mm -hmm. Well, the UDRP is the mechanism for resolving domain name disputes, and we've worked through that for many years now. Um, it, it It's different from uh, the social media context in the sense that the domain names uh, arise under one central quasi-governmental, in a way, system, and therefore there's a resolution mechanism that all of the domain name registrars have to sign on to. The social media companies are private companies, and so there's some question about whether or not someone can come along and just impose some centralized decision-making uh, regime on them. Beyond that, um, I think that uh, there really isn't a need for that at this mm. point. I think that the, between the terms and conditions of the websites and the ability of consumers and others uh, to resort to traditional enforcement mechanisms through the courts or through counsel is, seems to be handling the problem pretty well so far. Okay. And with the policies that, out, is out, that are out there, doesn't it always come down to enforcement? Like how well is the policy being enforced? Sure. Um, and I think brand owners are wise to remember that at the end of the day, it's their brand that they want to be making sure is enforced, and it's their responsibility to see that it's enforced, so they should take a very active role. The, the resolution tools are there to aid in this, but they are not, in the end, going to make sure that the brand is protected in the way that the legal system provides. Speaking of the legal system, might you be able to bring a trademark infringement claim pursuant to the Lanham Act, which of course is the federal tra trademark statute? Mm -hmm. You may, and in many cases you can, and certainly the specter of that helps to get some of these issues resolved, either through the social media company with pressure on the user or otherwise. I, I think the, the big issue here, though, is that sometimes we struggle with finding what's called a use in commerce. Mm -hmm. The federal trademark laws absolutely protect brands from infringement and unfair competition, passing off, those sorts of things. They protect celebrities from invasion of the right of publicity and privacy. But where you have a user that's using a celebrity name or a brand in a way to comment about that person and then that user doesn't have any goods or services for sale and it's not linking to anyone else, it's sometimes difficult to find the requisite use in commerce in order to bring you into the jurisdiction of the U.S. court system. And I guess in the case of One Oak versus Twitter then, that there was no resolution on that issue? Well, I don't think there was. My understanding is um, in that case the, the complaint was dismissed, I believe, the day after the complaint was filed, <laughs> voluntarily dismissed, so there appeared to be a pretty quick settlement, as I right. said a moment ago, sometimes the, the specter of uh, a federal court challenge is enough to get things resolved pretty quickly. And so you mentioned that it's on the brand owner to be hands-on about protecting their brand. What strategy would you recommend to protect your trademark in the realm of social media? Mm -hmm. Many of the same strategies that we've recommended all along before social media, certainly, as I said a moment ago, protect the brand, register your trademarks, have a good portfolio in the U.S. and abroad. Um, I think taking the holistic and multidisciplinary approach is very important as well so that you're, you're trying to satisfy all the various uh, stakeholders and issues that may be involved in using a brand on social media. Um, I think you have to uh, monitor the uses that are going on, particularly on fan sites, uh, sites where people interact with the brand. In many cases, uh, the conversation will be positive and will be buoyed actually by fans of the brand, but sometimes there are inappropriate communications, sometimes there's criticism that's undeserved or it's being presented in a way that is offensive to many people, so I think monitoring is a very important part of the protocol as well. Would you suggest being proactive and if you have a proposed brand or new brand coming out, then maybe go ahead and getting the vanity URL and the fan page for that particular brand? Absolutely, yes. In fact, we have, since I started my career, we have been involved in um, clearing br new brands for use, and that involves searching existing uses of trademarks by companies in the U.S. and abroad. And, and really, over the past several years, with the proliferation of domain names, it's a key inquiry now whether or not, for example, the .com is available. And if it is, that factors into whether or not a company is going to choose to go with that brand. 
importantly, it involves uh, capturing not just the exact brand name, but all the likely uh, variations, or as many variations as you want to maintain or, or use or block others from using. Okay, and so let's say that you discover that your mark is being used in an authorized manner. What steps should you take? Well, I think that uh, depending on the size of the company, certainly larger companies have a legal department and, a, and, and usually trademark expertise in-house, but if not, uh, I think it's wise for the business people to reach out to legal and understand what, first of all, is what we don't like on a website. Is that something that we can stop if it, if it comes to a legal matter? Uh, that helps inform the decision about what to do. But I also think it's important to involve PR uh, consideration early in the process, too. Public re relations? Yeah. Really? Why? Yes, because I've seen in some cases where uh, brands that are very popular and have spent a lot of time and money to speak with the voice and the brand attributes that they want, uh, they run into a problem and they send a cease and desist demand from lawyers. And that demand letter can be posted on the site and it, it's fine, it's legitimate, it, yeah. it's something that's part of brand enforcement, but it isn't necessarily consistent with the brand voice or the brand message. So we as lawyers um, don't always speak in a way that, that <laughs> uh, is so consumer friendly, right. but um, again, the integrated approach with PR and legal. And what about a more progressive view where you might actually just work with the um, page owner? Have you heard about that, or would you suggest that? Absolutely. There's there, uh, the potential for a business solution is a great solution in many cases. I've seen um, and helped negotiate deals where you know a brand owner has purchased uh, a domain name, for example, from someone else, or I've seen creative business deals. Other another major news organization actually hired uh, someone who had a vanity URL to become a consultant in social media for right. them. Wow. So really, the, there's an enormous number of opportunities on how these might be resolved, and often a business-to-business -business contact is more effective. When are there even media watch services out there or reputation protectors that can also assist in monitoring social media sites for the brand owners? There are, um, and I think that they are, uh, we're seeing more of them, and they're potentially very useful. I think the important part of that, though, for me is just for companies to be careful not to try to use those to game the system. And we have seen some brand owners who have um, put up what some call sock puppets hmm. or flogs, fake logs. What are socks, sock puppets? A, a sock puppet is where there's a, a member of a social media site who's raving about a product and it turns out it's an insider of okay. the company. Um, yes. Or a fake blog could be, for example, a child who has a Christmas list and is raving about a toy and that child is actually you know, a 50-year-old marketing executive <laughs> at a marketing agency or, some, or something else like that. So I think that it's important to monitor your reputation and to take steps to protect it and to know what's being said about you, but even more important probably is to have a steadfast commitment to communicating honestly and in a non-misleading way with your audience. All right, well, we're gonna have to leave it there, but thank you very much for sharing your insight with us today. Thank you. When we come back, our spotlight on contributed content, back in a moment. Digital technology has transformed the way we live our lives. We can access any piece of information at any time from anywhere. We can share ideas with thousands of people instantly. Staying up to date with breaking news and events is easier now than ever before. All this lets us keep pace with the world in real time. Yet, have any of these innovations been applied to the way we research and practice law? Starting today, the answer is yes. Welcome to Bloomberg Law the first and only real-time research system for the 21st century legal practice. Created by the leading provider of data and information services. A single search feature with access to legal, news, and company databases provides you with powerful legal research results and a holistic view of your clients. Filtered so you know the information you receive will be relevant every time. Customizable legal, financial, and news alerts keep you ahead of your clients and in tune with their world. An integrated workspace allows you to organize your results by client, by urgency, by topic, however you want it, and to share those results with people on your team. Log in now to experience Bloomberg Law. Now it's time for our Spotlight on Contributed Content. This is a segment where we highlight an article that was featured in one of our Bloomberg Law reports. Today's article comes to us from Natasha Shabani of Rudder Hobbs and Davidoff. The title of the article is Website Privacy Policy and Terms of Use. What are they for and why must they be posted? 
The article examines and explains the key provisions that a website owner's policies should contain. I found this article rather intriguing, and I hope you will too. You can find it in the October issue of our Bloomberg Law Report's Privacy and Information on the Terminal at PILRGO or at BloombergLaw.com. Articles are contributed to us for publication by practitioners, law professors, and other legal experts. To find out more about how you can contribute, please visit BloombergLaw.com. A special thank you to Ms. Shabani for that contributed piece. And again, our thanks to Robert Zelnick of McDermott, Will & Emery. Bye, everybody.